begin with uh, thanking you for joining our Honor Violence and Forced Marriage webinar. Uh, I'd like to introduce the team to you today that will be facilitating the training. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Stephanie Bodich, and I am the Executive Director of the AHA Foundation. Uh, the AHA Foundation was founded in 2007 by women's rights activist Ayan Hirsi Ali, and we are one of the leading organizations addressing honor violence, forced marriage, and female genital mutilation in the U.S. I have with me Nyla Amin, who will be leading the training. Uh, Nyla is a student in social work at NASA Community College in Garden City, New York. She's also a freelance writer and activist, and she dreams of someday opening a safe house in New York City for survivors of forced marriage. Uh, we're absolutely thrilled and fortunate to have Nyla with us here today. Um, we hope that you find the training beneficial. Please feel free to send us any questions you may have during the training, but note that in the interest of time, we will answer as many questions as we can get to, but at the end of the training. So, but please also feel free to share any questions you have with us after uh, the webinar. So before we begin the, uh, the training, what I would love to do is, is have Nyla um, share her story. So Nyla, can you tell us a little bit about yourself when you immigrated to the U.S.? And you can, can you please uh, describe for us your childhood growing up in the U.S.? Um, hi, everybody. I'm Nyla. Um, I was four years old when I came to the United States with my three siblings and pregnant mother. It was hard growing up in the U.S. as a first-generation Pakistani because I was bullied. I got my nose pierced in the second grade because it's ritual when we get married that we wear a piece in our nose. And when I went back after summer uh, ended into second grade, people would bully me and call me Hindu and all sorts of names because they had no idea what was going on. There was no cultural competency of any sort. The kids in second grade did not understand what was going on. As I grew older, my parents wanted me to cover my head. I would go to school. I would get called all sorts of name, names. And then after 9-11, I was actually almost attacked by somebody. And I was in the seventh grade, 13 years old. And that's when my father said, take the hijab off. The hijab is the covering on the head of a Muslim woman. woman. And... Um, Basically, it was like living a double life, and I wouldn't wish it upon anyone. I feel like if you bring your child into this country, you should be able to adapt to its environment. You cannot, you know, uproot a plant from another country and then come plant it in another soil and expect it to grow the way that it was in the other country. So I must say that my experience in my childhood was extremely hard. I got engaged at eight years old, and that is the day that my life really changed forever. And Nyla, uh, since I, I I know your um you know your 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 background, when you did start having conflicts with your parents about some of your you know your sort of typical teenage choices like the the boy you were dating or the clothes you were wearing um, when you started to have issues with your parents did you feel at the time that you could turn to someone or an agency for support absolutely not i wish aha was around back then because maybe i wouldn't be in the shoes i'm in now but um i know that in the united states it's not when I went in t when I started having problems with my parents, there was nobody to turn to. I can go to a social worker in school and say, hey, listen, I got engaged at eight and I had my religious ceremony done at 13. Now I'm 14 and in the ninth grade and I have a Spanish boyfriend. Help me. And there, she looked at me like I had six heads because people don't have the right training. They don't have the awareness. And there was no foundation. There was nowhere for me to go to except for foster care after my father beat me up. And that's the only way that Child Protective Services got involved is after he beat me and stopped letting me go to school because of the boy. So I would say absolutely there was no support for me. Only until I got abused is when Child Protective Services came in. But I believe that if this was criminalized and considered a crime in the U.S. a long time ago, that none, I would have not went through what I went through. And you ended up going back to Pakistan when you were 15. 
did you know at the time that you would end up the victim of a forced marriage? Actually, I did not. I ran away from a group home. I was in foster care and I missed my home. Everyone, of course, loves their parents. So I ran away and I went back home. And when I went back home, my parents were like, you're a ward of the state right now. So let's go back to Pakistan for your cousin's wedding. You stay there for three years, turn 18, and then we'll bring you back. And this way, the state will have no jurisdiction over you. And I'm like, all right, it's like a three-year vacation. It's better than the group home life. And it was like a little mini jail. So, no, I had no idea that I was going to become a child bride. And when you were married off by your parents, uh, why was it difficult, if not impossible, for you to report the forced marriage or to leave the marriage? It was very impossible because I'm Pashtun, which is a tribal They're very tribal people, and I live in a village where you need a horse and carriage to get to, like, the main, to, like, say, for example, Penn Station in New York City. Then from there, you carpool and get into a car and go into the city. It's horse and carriage. It's like the Amish way of living. A boy died on my street, and the cops came six days later. So that just shows you that there's no support. You can give the cops money, and that's it. It's done. There's no rights for women in Pakistan, and there was nowhere nowhere for me to turn to. And how did you end up getting back to the U.S.? Uh, my mom's um, cousin... Uh, actually the first time I ran away in Pakistan, I went to Islamabad and he came and got me from there and convinced me to go back to the marriage. Everything will be fixed. But when he took me back, my uncle and ex-husband were waiting for me outside with AK 47s loaded, ready to kill me. And that's when my uncle realized he made a mistake. And then they accused my uncle of eloping with me. So in the car, I gave him my child protective services workers um, phone and name. And I told him if something happens to me today, because I was ready to go die. I knew they were going to kill me when I went back home. Once I got in the car with the two AK-47s, my husband and my cousin, I knew I was just, I was just getting ready to die. And basically um, he called CPS. And then one day two people from the U S consulate showed up in my village and they said we can't help you because you're married in the islamic sharia law of pakistan but if you can find refuge and get to the u.s embassy we can help you unfortunately that wasn't possible but because my parents had left me there all alone my mother was here so they arrested her and demanded that i come back and that's how i came back in march of 2005. And when you returned to the U.S., did you feel like you received the support you needed based on on what had happened to you? Absolutely not. Not in a sense of me being a child bride. I mean, the foster care system, they had no idea on what to do with me because they have no idea on what honor violence or forced marriage is. They have no idea what it is. So how do you understand something that you do not know? I got the support and yeah, them them taking me away and putting me in a safe haven, but did I get the right mental help and the right support and the right therapy? No, I didn't because foundations like AHA were not around. And people are not educated about this stuff. And I definitely did not get the right support at all. And that's why I think that us informing the world and educating people on honor violence and forced marriage is extremely important. Okay. And today you're close to your parents. What happened to bring you together again as a family? Um, I was actually 18 when I moved back home, and you'll always love your parents, no matter what they do, you know, you always have that empty hole inside of you, and I remember working at restaurants, and I would see families coming in, I was like 16, 17, when I wasn't living with them, and I would get envious inside, and I missed my family, and When I left my son's father, who is not the guy I was forced to marry, I was 18. I moved out alone and um, my parents were like, why don't you come back home? So I came back home. Everyone was really kind of cold at first and very quiet, but 
soon everyone just started loving me and my brothers they everyone started to warm up to me and then about a year ago I had a little mental breakdown I went to anger management I started yelling at my father like how could you do this you gave them your daughter to rape and beat how could you do this? And he looked me in my eye and he said, Nyla, if I knew better, I would do better. He said, I didn't know any better. And it took me 10 years to forgive that man. And you know what? He was only doing what he thought was best for me. Over here in America, people like to kick their kids out at 18 because they think that's what's best for them to be responsible and whatnot. And in Pakistan, I guess if your little girl is acting out, you get her married and you know, push her off into someone else's hands thinking he might, the husband might, you know, put her into line or check. But um, I do feel like my father is very apologetic. And because of me, my little sister is almost 22. She's going to become a social worker as well. And she's not engaged, married. And I actually heard my father on the phone to someone saying the mistakes I have made with Nyla, I will not make again. And I literally thought I was hearing things and he held me and he said, I am sorry. And he cried to me a few days before he left in January and he said, forgive me. And to this day, believe it or not, he still gives me an allowance. I think he's just trying to make up for what he did to me. And what advice, this is our, our last question, but what advice would you give to professional, to the professionals participating in this webinar? I would say a lot of Middle Eastern girls, if you get them, they're not always Middle Eastern, majority of them are. Look for signs, interrogate, ask more questions. When they tell you I'm engaged, ask them, was it, if they're Muslim, a nikah is the Muslim way of getting married. I can go right now with, if I had a 15 year old daughter, and with a man 18, 23, 24, I can literally go into a New York City mosque right now and get them married. Something's got to change. My advice is, is that you look for the signs, you ask these girls questions, and you tell them that there is help. There are survivors out there like you. And I think the best key component in this is, is that education, you guys need to know what honor violence is and forced marriage. There's a difference between forced marriages and arranged marriages. A forced marriage is when you have no choice, your life is at risk. Arranged is when both parties agree to it. So my advice is, is to be more keen, be aware, be alert, be educated, and talk to your client. And if you have to share my story with them, tell them this girl did it, her father forgave her. Her strict father, who I never thought would forgive me for having a baby with someone that was not the guy I was married to in Pakistan. So if my father could come around, anyone can. And just look out for signs, ask them questions. And if they tell you I'm engaged, don't let them go back home. Because if they say no, it's going to end up in honor violence most likely. Or they'll be smuggled out of the country. So a little word of advice, just keep an eye open and just be aware. This is a very new topic trending in the United States. It's been happening all along, but it's just coming out and we can no longer sweep it under the rug. Thank you, Nyla. Uh, thank you for sharing your story. And if you would like to go ahead, please, with the training. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Um, this presentation will address the issues of honor-based violence and forced marriage. Honor vi what is honor violence? Honor violence is a form of violence against women. The motive of honor violence is for the perpetrator to protect or regain his honor, the honor of his family or that of the community at large. Who are the victims? Victims of honor violence are targeted because their actual or perceived behavior is considered shameful by their families. More generally, a victim may be targeted if she is considered to have violated the cultural or religious norms of her family or community. Honor violence is rarely 
an isolated one-off incident. Rather, honor violence tends to involve systematic control over the victim by members of her family. This control may begin at a young age and escalate over a period of time. Honor violence may be perpetrated by a single individual. It can also be a group campaign of violence and harassment committed by an entire family along with members of their community. Honor violence can take many forms. It can include verbal abuse, threats, stalking, harassment, forcible confinement, physical violence, sexual violence, and even homicide. The phenomenon of phenomenon of honor violence is not unique to any one ethnic or cultural group. Honor violence occurs in many different and diverse communities. In North America, cases of honor violence have involved families from countries such as Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Egypt, Bangladesh, and India. How is honor violence different from domestic violence? One of my favorite questions. Honor violence shares several features with domestic violence, and it's not always easy to draw a bright line distinction between a case described as domestic violence and one involving honor violence. In many cases, domestic violence and honor violence will overlap considerably. However, there are several key ways in which honor violence differs from domestic violence. The nature of the relationship. In a traditional domestic violence scenario, the perpetrator of violence is involved or has previously been involved in an intimate or romantic relationship with the victim. She may be his wife, ex-wife, girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, mother of a child in common, or intimate partner. With honor-based violence, the victim may be any family member whose behavior is deemed unacceptable to the family. Single versus multiple perpetrators. Domestic violence typically involves harm inflicted by a single perpetrator without the aid or support of family or community. In an honor violence scenario, multiple family or community members may be involved in a campaign of violence against the victim. For example, the father may be physically violent while the mother is engaging in emotional abuse or manipulation at the same time as a sibling is monitoring the victim's behavior and reporting back to his parents. Family members may band together to deny any allegations of wrongdoing and to cover up any appearance of improperty in their behavior. For these reasons, it's important for service providers, along with law enforcement, to recognize the role often played by multiple family members in an honor violence scenario. The perception of criminality. Perpetrators of DV typically understand that they're committing a crime. In the cycle of violence, the perpetrator often feels guilt and fears being caught or discovered as an abuser. In an honor violence scenario, it is uncommon to find perpetrators who do not believe that they're committing a crime. They often believe that their conduct is justified, perhaps even required, because of the victim's behavior. This attitude may be rooted in deeply held cultural and religious beliefs or even the legal system of the family's country of origin. To highlight this point, consider the example of a murder that occurred in Queens, New York. The victim was a young woman named Samia, who was engaged to marry a much older man named Farid Popol. Samia's parents had arranged the marriage over Samia's objections. On the day of her death, Samia told Popol that she did not wish to marry him and that she had a boyfriend. This prompted a brutal attack in which Popol killed Samia and then burned and dismembered her body. Popol's brother helped him dispose of the body, which has never been recovered. In the aftermath of the killing, Popol said this to a friend. In Afghanistan, she would be considered a whore for the way she lived. She would be killed, and I would be considered a hero. Popol was convicted of murder in 2006 and is now serving a life sentence. His brother was also convicted for his role in disposing of the body. 
But the scenario that played out in this case and Popol's apparent belief that this actions that his actions were justified, sadly, this is not unique. Support of the perpetrator. A perpetrator of domestic violence will typically not have support of the family. In an honor violence scenario, a perpetrator's family will often share his belief that the victim brought on the violence by her own behavior. The perpetrator may have the support of religious leaders and other community members and may even have the support of the victim's family. Ostracism of the victim. This is another key distinction between honor violence and domestic violence. While this isn't true in every case, a victim of domestic violence may have a support network of family and friends who encourage her to leave the abusive relationship. So while a domestic violence victim may internalize the abuser's message that she deserves the abuse because of her conduct, this perception will not be reinforced by her family and community. By comparison, a victim of honor violence is likely to be shunned by her family and community because of her dishonorable behavior. She will face heavy pressure to change her behavior so as to bring peace to the family and restore its honor. Because she was raised in an honor-based culture, she may believe that she deserves the abuse she's suffering. Religious coercion. Religious, religion may play a very different role for victims in an honor violence scenario. In these situations, the victims may fear religious repercussions for going against the family and may face pressure from religious leaders to change her conduct. In contrast, while some religious leaders in traditionally conservative religions may pressure an abused spouse to remain in a domestic violence situation to avoid divorce, this approach is becoming less accepted, and religious coercion in this context does not usually extend to non-spouse victims of violence. I want to make a little note on male victims because not only females are objected to forced marriages and honor killings. While the victims of honor violence are most commonly females, males also may be targeted. Here are some common reasons why a male family member may be subjected to honor violence. If he is discovered to be dating outside of his cultural community, if he's resistant arranged marriage, or most commonly if he is gay or is perceived to be gay. The Shafia sisters, 19-year-old Zainab, 17-year-old Sahar, and 13-year-old Giti Shafia, were born in Afghanistan. After living in various other Middle Eastern countries, they immigrated to Canada with their parents and siblings in 2007. The Shafia family was not a typical nuclear family. The girls' fathers, Mohammed Shafia, had married a woman named Rona before the girls were born. When Rona proved unbearable to bear children, Mohammed Shafia took a second wife who would give birth to the three sisters and three other siblings. Rona continued to live with the family but was treated more like a servant than Mohammed's first wife. She was permitted to enter Canada on the false premise that she was Mohammed's cousin. After moving to Canada, Zainab, Sahar, and Giti easily adopted Western culture and became typical Canadian teenagers. They wore Western clothing and makeup, went to the mall with their friends, and the two older girls had boyfriends. But their parents, particularly their father, did not approve of this behavior. The Shafia sisters told numerous authorities that they were afraid of their parents and their brother Hamid, who served as disciplinarian in their father's absence. The girls made numerous attempts to alert authorities to violence in their home. In May of 2008, Sahar tells a teacher about physical violence against her by Hamid at her parents' behest and emotional abuse by her mother. CPS is then called and conducts an interview. Two days after the initial CPS interview, Sahar was wearing a hijab and claimed things had improved at home. CPS deemed the complaint found it, but the case was closed because Sahar stopped cooperating. In April of 2009, Zainab fled to a women's shelter to escape abuse at home. 
Sahar and Giti called 911 because they were afraid of their father's reaction. During the police interview conducted away from their parents, the girls reputed, reported physical abuse the previous week because they came home late from the mall. Giti reported that their father often threatened to kill them. Both girls told police that they were afraid of their father and wanted to leave home. CPS arrived and interviewed the girls in front of their parents. They stopped talking and recanted some of their previous allegations of abuse. After subsequent interviews, CPS closed the file. In May of 2009, Sahar attempts suicide. CPS conducts an interview during which Sahar reports violence by her brother. The caseworker noted that she was crying profusely and was obviously extremely scared. Sahar reported that her parents had not spoken to her for months and that she was being pressured to wearing a hijab and was being held out of school. But after learning that her, her allegations would be reported to her parents, Sahar stopped cooperating. During a subsequent interview, Sahar minimized the previous allegations and said things were better at home. In June of 2009, a teacher notices that Sahar was missing school and coming in late and asks her what is going on. Sahar said that she was afraid of her father, who was due to return from a trip to Dubai. She was afraid that her brother was going to tell him that she was a whore. The teacher calls CPS and asks for Sahar's caseworker from the previous report. CPS says there is no caseworker assigned and advises the teacher to find a shelter in the community. June 30, 2009, the bodies of Zainab, Sahar, and Giti, along with their polygamous father's first wife, are discovered in a car submerged in a small canal. In January 2012, the girl's father, mother, and brother are convicted of, mother, of murder. They were each sentenced to life in prison. The girl's father had this to say about his daughters after their death. God's curse on them. May the devil shit on their graves. Is that what a daughter should be? Would a daughter be such a whore? They betrayed humankind. They betrayed Islam. They betrayed our religion and creed. They betrayed our tradition. They betrayed everything. Even if they hoist me up onto the gallows, nothing is more dear to me than my honor. Let's leave our destiny to God and may God never make me, you, or your mother honorless. To Hamid. I am happy and my conscience is clear. They haven't done good and God punished them. Noor Aramaleki. She was born in Iraq. Noor immigrated to the U.S. with her family at the age of four. Noor grew up to become a typical American teenager wearing Western clothing and makeup, listening to rock music, and socializing with boys. Noor's parents, particularly, particularly her father, Fale Al-Maleki, strongly disapproved of her lifestyle. In 2007, Noor was tricked by her family to travel to Iraq, where she was reportedly forced to marry a cousin. She returned to the U.S. with her family and continued living in their home. Tension within the family continued to escalate, and after repeated altercations, Noor moved into her own apartment. She feared her parents to such a degree that she obtained a police escort to retrieve her belongings. Noor attempted to support herself with various restaurant jobs, but was forced to quit each position when her parents learned where she was working and harassed her at work. Unable to maintain a job in the face of this constant harassment, Noor returned home for a brief period, then went to live with another Iraqi family whom she had known since childhood. Noor's family was enraged by this move and began harassing her and the family, once to the point that the police were called. October 20th, 2009, four months after moving in with Amal Khalaf and her family, Noor and Amal spotted her father at the local welfare office where Noor was helping Amal apply for the benefits. Noor texted her friends that she had seen her father, describing him as evil and saying that seeing him made her feel so shaky. Fale left the office without incident, and a short while later, Noor and Amal also left and began walking across the parking lot. As they walked, Fale drove headfirst into them, striking both women with his jeep. 
He then fled the scene and, with assistance from his wife, son, and other family members, fled the country. He was apprehended in London nine days later. Amal survived with serious injuries and Noor died 13 days later. In February 2011, Faleh al-Maliki was convicted of second-degree murder, aggravated assault, and leaving the scene of an accident. He was sentenced to 34 and a half years in prison. In taped conversation with Noor's mother while he was in jail, Fale had the following to say about his daughter. For an Iraqi, honor is the most valuable thing. No one messed up our life except Noor. No one hates his daughter, but honor is pressure, and we are a tribal society. I didn't kill someone off the street. I try to give her a chance. These two cases obviously represent the most extreme forms of honor violence. Both cases were reported widely in the national news media, but it's important to note there have been many other cases involving honor violence, even honor killings, that have not yet received such widespread attention. Our organization has commissioned a study into the incidence of honor violence in the United States, and although we don't have conclusive results yet, the preliminary numbers are quite disturbing. Forced marriages. A forced marriage occurs when an individual is forced, coerced, threatened, or tricked to marry without her informed consent. Forced marriage is a real, a very real problem in the United States. In September 2011, the Tahiri Justice Center released survey results that found as many as 3,000 cases of forced marriages within immigrant communities in the U.S. in the two years preceding the survey. survey. Since the Tahiri survey was based on responses from service providers alone, the actual number of forced marriages likely much higher. Like honor violence, forced marriage affects individuals and families from a very broad range of backgrounds and religions, from first-generation Pakistani families living in Minnesota to Orthodox Jewish families that have lived in Brooklyn for four generations. Forced marriage is a problem that spans many cultural and religious communities. Forced marriage is, a diff is different from an arranged marriage. In many cultures, it is customary for families to arrange meetings between their children in the hopes of fostering a voluntary relationship that will lead to marriage. In these situations, while the initial meetings are arranged by the families and a marriage is encouraged, the ultimate decision regarding whether to marry remains with the couple and both parties' consent. Ultimately, the different boils down to free choice and consent, the freedom to choose one spouse and to consent to a marriage. There are many different reasons why an individual may be forced into the marriage. Some of the common tactics for enforcing a forced marriage are, well, some of the for, some of um, the different reasons why an individual may be forced into the marriage is because of cultural and religious traditions, uh, the family wanting to control unwanted sexuality, including perceived prom promiscuity, eradicating perceived or actual homosexuality, or being transgender. They're trying to control the unwanted behavior, particularly, con particularly especially if they're too westernized, preventing unsuitable relationships such as those outside of particular ethnic, cultural, or religious group, promoting and protecting family status, solidarity or honor, securing immigration status for the spouse and family, enhancing the economic status of the family, securing care for a disabled family member, v VIA the new spouse, domestic servitude, paying for a wrong committed by another family member. Some of the common tactics for enforcing a forced marriage are physical violence or threats of violence, emotional blackmail, for example, if the mother threatens suicide if the girl does not consent to the marriage, which my mother did, removal from school, isolation and confinement in the home, false imprisonment, ostracism from family and community, economic threats, 
threats to younger siblings taken abroad and left there until the marriage occurs, conducting a marriage ceremony abroad without the victim being present. A note about coercion and force, particularly when we talk about scenarios where no physical violence is used, a family member may not realize that their behavior has crossed the line from merely encouraging an arranged marriage to forcing and co or coercing an individual to enter a marriage. The consequences of forced marriage. It's important to note that forcing an individual into a marriage may be only the beginning of his or her suffering. Where the marriage itself is forced, it is not uncommon for the victim to experience one or more of the following. Repeated violence and physical abuse within the marriage. Repeated sexual abuse and rape within the marriage. Abuse of children on the marriage. Social isolation. Forced withdrawal from school or work, psychological consequences such as anxiety and depression, self-harm or suicide. There is often an intersection or overlap between forced marriage and honor violence. Families upset with a child's behavior may threaten him or her with a forced marriage as a way of controlling or ending their behavior. Conversely, resisting an arranged marriage may lead to honor violence and therefore transform an attempt at arranged marriage into a forced marriage. For example, in March of this year, a Yemen-born Yemen mother living in Hollywood, Florida, was arrested and charged with child abuse. The police alleged that the woman repeatedly burned her 17-year-old daughter with a hot knife to punish her for talking to a boy she met online. Reportedly, the mother was enraged because she had already arranged for her daughter to marry an older cousin. This scenario is a classic example of how resisting a forced or arranged marriage can lead to honor violence. There may be a human trafficking component into a forced marriage scenario. For example, a girl may be sold into marriage in exchange for a dowry or immigration benefit, then repeatedly raped by her new husband. This situation would be characterized as a form of sex trafficking. There are also scenarios in which forced marriages become a force of labor, a form of labor trafficking, in which a girl is forced to marry as a means for the husband's family to acquire a domestic servant or laborer. Now, the best practices for working with, with victims is number one. Take allegations of honor violence seriously. Don't let concerns about cultural sensitivity interfere with taking efforts to protect the victim. What we mean here is simple. It's important to respect different cultural backgrounds and beliefs, and all victims should be given non-judgmental, culturally appropriate advice. But violence is violence and abuse is abuse. Our tolerance towards religious and cultural practices must cease any time there is an indication of violence, coercion, or oppression. Be wary of family members. Noor al Maliki's mother, investigator, referred to her as the most evil person he had ever encountered. Number three is stay involved. Um, take action if a forced marriage appears eminent. Now, the best practices for investigation is, number one, the first thing you're going to deal with is the girl is not going to cooperate. Do, don't expect cooperation. A lot of the girls are scared to speak out, so you must dig and dig. Number two, consider the involvement of other family members. For example, the Popol case, brother was convicted for his role in helping dispose the body after the murder. So you also have to consider if the girl tells you everything now, you have to have a plan for her to have a safe haven to go to because she can't go back to that home because that will turn into honor violence. Number three, be cautious with translators. And I'm telling you this from personal experience. We realize it may be difficult, if not impossible, to find a translator that isn't from the same cultural community as the victim. In these cases, speak to the translator be before introducing him or her 
and emphasize the importance of confidentiality. Take your cue from the victim and how she appears to feel about speaking with this particular translator. I had a doctor tell my parents when I was in care that I should be, a psychiatrist told my dad I should be stoned to death. So that just shows you that you can't trust everybody. And she was Pakistani herself. So my recommendation to everyone here is just be aware, be alert. And in the beginning, the girls are not going to be open. But it's our job to make them feel comfortable and at home. Thank you so much. Stephanie, I'm going to hand it over to you now. Okay, thank you, uh, Nyla. Um, this is, of course, the end of our training. Um, I would like to thank you for participating. Um, we've not received any questions, or at least the kind of questions we've received have been around whether or not you can get a copy of the presentation, which we plan to send out um, to everyone. And in fact, we're hoping to record the webinar and be able to share it with uh, more people after the training. But maybe what we should do is take a few minutes, um, maybe five minutes or so, for, for people to write down any questions they may have. And then I also wanted to take this opportunity to thank Nyla for sharing her experience in surviving a forced marriage. You um, welcome. I would also, <laughs> I'm sorry, thank you, Nyla. You're welcome. And I would also like to point out that the AHA Foundation, in partnership with Crisis Text Line, is launching a text line for victims of honor violence and forced marriage. This means that victims will be able to speak anonymously with a crisis counselor 24 hours a day, seven days a week, by texting the word FREE, that's F-R-E-E, -E. and people, if they want to use the, the text line, um, they should text 741741. It's 741741. Um, so again, before we completely end the, um, the webinar, we'll just give you a few minutes to um, send us any questions you may have. Nana? Yes. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I was muted. Um, we did receive a question that's uh, specifically for you, if, okay. um, if you don't mind answering. Of course. Um, and uh, apologies for reading the question. Um, I guess, do you think you would have been more or less likely to urge him to call for help if you knew that forced marriage was a criminal offense in the U.S. and that your parents might be arrested, prosecuted, jailed? or deported for that crime if convicted? I'm, um, and that, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't, is, is this question coming from a man? I don't, I, can you please repeat it? Sure, the, the question is basically, do you think that you would have been more likely or less likely um, to have urged your uncle to call for help if you knew that forced marriage was a criminal offense in the US 
and that your parents might be arrested, prosecuted, jailed, and deported for the crime if convicted? To be honest, I wouldn't do anything different because I knew that in the United States, I was 14 when I entered foster care and got married at 15. I knew they knew nothing about it. So I would have still done the same thing. And I think me doing that one step is why I'm here talking to everybody today. Saved my life. So I would not. I'm sorry. No, I'm saying so I would definitely still tell my uncle to call no matter what, whether it was illegal or not. A criminal marriage, whether it was if forced marriage was illegal or not, I would have still took the same steps, um, whether it was illegal here or not, because I am a U.S. citizen and I deserve to be in my country. And there is a second part to the question, and it, you know, it, it very much relates to the um, the first part. And my apologies for not asking you, um, you know, both questions at the same time. But the, the the question is rather long. Would it have made a difference to your actions in that moment if forced marriage were a federal crime? Then, when what difference would it have made? What do you think it would have meant in terms of how your family reacted to you in that moment or long term if your parents had in fact been prosecuted and convicted? Do you mean like when I when I came back if it was illegal and what would have happened to my parents and how I would have felt? Um, yeah, assuming that I, you know these are hypothetical situations. So in other words, if forced marriage were in fact a federal crime and your parents um, had been convicted, had been prosecuted and convicted, um, what do you think it would have meant for your family? In other words, how would your family have reacted to you in that moment or in the longer term um, if your parents had been prosecuted and and convicted? Uh, Well, my poor mother did spend a night in jail. My mom wears a headscarf, speaks no English, so she was kind of prosecuted. But I would still not change my decision because you know what? I live for me. I come first. And the decision I make is for my life. And we live life once. And no one should tell you who to date, who to be with. It is 2015. We have been to the moon. No one should tell us who to date, who to love. We barely get along with our friends. So how can we be with someone that we don't want to be with? I would not change my decision if everyone left me, including my whole family. And I lived without my family for about three years after everything. And I would not change my decision, even if they were to get arrested, whatever. I'm not being cruel. I love my parents. I know nothing would have happened to them. They would have came out, whatever the case may be. But when you do something wrong, you have to pay the price. And I'm sorry if that sounds cold, but What's illegal is illegal. Nala, we have another question. Um, What are the pros and cons of separating honor-based violence from domestic violence, especially for the police? Automatically, the pros on uh, the police, they're very used to cases of domestic violence. So automatically, they go somewhere and they see a woman beat, and their first thing is, oh, my God, domestic violence. So because there's, they don't have any information on this or training, and I think the, it's so much different because domestic violence is what we automatically think when we see a girl beat up. Like when my father beat me up and I had a bite mark on my arm, that looked like domestic violence. But police have to be educated because you have to be able to interview the the victim on why were you beaten were you beaten because your dad didn't like the way you dress or because you have a spanish boyfriend or you're not covering your head so the pros and cons of differentiating is is the pro i guess would the pro like the positive of it would be is that domestic violence cases are usually it ha- if it happens once, statistics show that police will be called to that home again. So you usually see domestic violence a lot. But with honor violence, it gets a little bit tricky because a lot of times, like I said, the girls don't want to cooperate because they're scared. 
The only thing I want to add is that, of course, you know, when you um, sort of the distinction between or separating honor-based violence from domestic violence for the police. I mean, in honor-based violence, there are often multiple perpetrators. And then I think that, you know, in the stories that Nyla shared, um, what was important is that uh, with, you know, with those girls, um, the situation would have been very different if they had been kept safe by by placing them in foster care outside of the family because with domestic violence usually what you do um, with survivors is put them with um, family members so they're not alone but in the case of honor violence you actually want to try and separate um, the victim from the family in case there are multiple family members involved yes I do believe in um I do believe that even in my case, um, my brothers were involved, you know, I told my brother, I don't want to do this, but he said, I did it. You have to do it too. So there are definitely more than one. My mother was just a woman that was there to, you know, be there. Like she had no say women in our culture have no say. So there are definitely, in my case, there were multiple perpetrators, siblings, mother, father, uncle, aunts. So it's it's a very tricky topic. And I believe that the best thing we can do right now is to raise awareness. Everyone, every shelter, everyone in the United States should know that this exists. And there's a big difference between domestic violence and honor violence. Because domestic violence happens a lot. We all know it happens. But I also want to make another thing clear. With domestic violence, you get beat up. You can put the girl in a... Sh um, she's 18. You take her out of the home. Police put her in a shelter. You get a call from a 16 and a half year old. I'm being beat and abused and my father wants to get me married. Now, where do you put that child? Because it's not illegal. Child Protective Services won't recognize that as an abuse because marriage is not illegal. And because the child has not been beaten, they will not take her away. So where does that girl go? She has nowhere to go. Next thing you know, she's on a plane to her native country. That's why I am going to open up a group home for underage, for girls under 18, so they have a safe haven to go to. Because I think what we need to concentrate on is that these girls are going into marriage between the ages of 14 to 16, so even 13 to 16, right here in the U.S. So I think that would be one of the biggest, tackling that would be one of the biggest issues. So I believe awareness is key. Absolutely. And, and again, I want to thank you so much for, for leading this training, uh, Nyla. And again, for the participants, please feel free to send us feedback or any questions um, you may have. And we will share the presentation with you. And again, hopefully, we'll have a recording of this webinar. So thanks, everyone. Um, take care. Thank you, everybody.